Thank you. Good afternoon. You know, it's such a big room and few of us, we can just talk one-on-one, -on -one, I think. Uh, you know, I've given a lot of talks uh, uh, in my career, and never in a movie theater. This is a, an interesting experience here. So today's talk uh, is, uh, you know, before I dive in, first of all, how many of you have heard of Redis? Okay, that's pretty good. And how many of you are using Redis in some way? Okay, all right. You know, Redis, uh, I'm going to have a video at the end. It'll give you a, a good perspective on how some very, very large global companies are using Redis. And, and today's talk is really about how do we go from here to the future. I know this conference is all about artificial intelligence, uh, but underpinning that is a large number of technologies that make it happen. And, and, and the world we live in is, is really a world of instant, right? What we do today is so much more than what we did a year ago, two years ago. Our productivity tends to go up exponentially every year with new tools and technologies, and the expectation on us keeps on going up. The bosses we have expect us to do more in the same eight hours of work, right? Anybody doing less today than they did last year? Uh, probably not. Um, and, and our expectations in our daily lives are, are all about getting what we want, when we want, and to get it immediately. Right? We don't have the patience. If you're watching a movie on Netflix, we want that to show up immediately. The menu, it better be to our personalized requirements. If you're ordering a cab, Uber, you want it to show up in the next two, three, four minutes, and you want the responses to be immediate. Um, if you're doing shopping on Amazon, you want that to work. And, and, and anything in life today is really, if it's not instantaneous, we don't have patience for it. Our attention span is going down every day. There are studies that say, you know, anywhere between eight and maybe down to two seconds is our attention span these days. And as the generations, the millennials and the younger generations come in, their attention spans are even shorter. So how do you achieve that and meet the expectations of the consumer when it's becoming so difficult. Everything has to be within, within that instant that you're looking for. You know, we're all used to this. You click on something, and then you wait for the circle, and then something appears, right? No longer. I don't think we have the patience for this anymore. If it's slow, it might as well not work, right? We want it to work. And, and, and it's not just a matter of experience. There's actual real revenue that can be impacted. We all know Amazon is the largest e-commerce player in the world, and, and they have something called a Prime Day, Amazon Prime Day. Earlier this year, they had a, uh, a hiccup in their operation for several hours. It cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. So it was not that the people could not connect to Amazon, but the service and the experience got slowed down to an extent where the transactions were not completing at the time, and they were time out. And so from a user standpoint, Slow or disconnected is the same thing. And so the revenue is at risk if, if that instant experience is not delivered. <laughs> you know, in, in our estimate, there are four major macro trends in the marketplace that are driving what we experience today and what we can expect to experience tomorrow and five years from tomorrow. And, and here are in, in no particular order. So first is quantum computing. You know, this has been around and talked about for about 30 years now. But finally, quantum computing is getting to a point where it is going to become a reality in the next year, maybe two years. So quantum computing is, is, is a way of processing data uh, based on quantum physics. So the data is stored in what's known as quantum bits or qubits. And, and there is a threshold of 50 qubits. The moment the industry can hit 50 qubits, you will have a computer that can process better than any supercomputer can today with less, with fewer resources. Intel has announced earlier this year that it did a test chip with 49 qubits. So we are almost there. We are the cusp of making quantum computing a reality. And the moment that happens, what we are used to in our daily lives, on our cell phones, on our computers, and even in the kind of supercomputers, I think will be taken to a whole new level, thus delivering brand new experiences that we have not seen so far. The next one is persistent memory. You know, we, we all know that RAM is where the processing happens, calculations happen. And we know that disk, hard disk, are where data gets stored. 
right? So if you have Oracle database, it sits on a hard disk, and you retrieve the data, you process and do the calculations in RAM. The problem is RAM is fast but very expensive, and hard disks are cheap but very slow, right? So how do you bridge the gap? What persistent memory is trying to do is give you the performance of RAM at the price point of a hard disk, right? So it's trying to bridge that gap. And, and we are getting very close. We, do, we work very closely with Intel and Samsung, the companies that are leading the initiatives around persistent memory. And, and we're getting to a point where within the next six months, three months, uh, you will see this is becoming reality. And, and that has, is a game changer because you can store incredible amounts of data and get performance at almost as good as RAM. The third thing is 5G. So Europe certainly has been a leader in LTE, 4G, and, and, and now moving uh, to, to 5G. And, and we on the cell phones are used to getting a megabit per second, five megabits per second, if you're lucky, maybe up to 10 megabits per second, right? What 5G promises is, and the tests have, some early tests have shown, we can expect to a gigabits per second type of a throughput on our cell phones. Now, we may not get a gig, but, but if you get 700, 500, 400 megabits per second, that's a game changer. Already today, we're used to watching videos. We're used to doing almost everything we want, and we're pretty good, and the experience is good. But think about if you now had the capacity that was a few hundred times what you'd get today, and we're getting close to that. And finally, what this event's about is artificial intelligence. You know, earlier I was doing an interview, somebody asked me, is artificial intelligence, is, you know, is, this, is that too much hype, and is this going to sort of die down, and are we going through the, the trough of disillusionment in, in Gartner's terms? And, and, and I don't think so. Um, I think all the way from you know, complicated things like facial recognition to autonomous, autonomous driving vehicles to even things like the, the recent refresh Google has on its, on its Gmail is it gives you, you know, recommendation. It, it fills out the answers for you. It gives you answers that might be appropriate, and you can just click on it, and you're done. Those are all examples of algorithms, machine learning algorithms that are supporting uh, AI, underpinning, uh, underpinning AI. And, and I think there is no facet of our life that will not be touched by AI. So if you take all of these things together and you think about what's possible in the future between communications, processing, algorithms, you have a world that zero latency is, is really becoming real. You know, you almost have to just think and it happens. That's the vision we have for, for, for the future. Bringing it down a notch to the applications. Now, how many of you are application developers? Okay, and how many of you are sort of in the DevOps that you operate applications or integrate various applications together? You know, regardless of the three environments you're in, you are being influenced by certain brand new paradigms that might have been around for a while but are, but are becoming reality today. The first one is cloud native and microservices. You know, this is where instead of having a monolithic application, you are now getting an application that's developed with very specific use cases, very specific services that together make it a single application. Again, going back to the Uber example, you might, under Uber, maybe 100 uh, microservices running, a geospatial microservices, a, a credit microservice, a financial service microservice. Uh, you might have on credit card balance microservice, your profile microservice, and so on, right? All of those together give you the experience that you get when you're using. So that's the microservice. The second piece is cloud is clearly a reality, right? Soon we'll see you know, greater than 50% of the workload is going to be in the cloud. But, but it's not going to be a single cloud. It's not going to be just a public cloud. It's likely to be a private cloud, public cloud, you know, running underpinned by AWS, Google, Azure, um, and, and perhaps others. And, and you might be running in your own enterprise uh, cloud, private clouds of your own. What will not happen is everything from on-premise is not going to move to the cloud. Some things for governance reasons, for how things operate in your company, will remain on-premises. And so this hybrid world of cloud and on-premises is likely to be status quo. And the applications have to deal with that. And finally, you know, the, the thing about we want when we want, we also want where we want, right? And, and this is not just about are we moving from, you know, I live in California, I'm in, in Madrid today, and, and I still want to have the same experience on everything I do regardless. I don't want any degradation of services. Similarly, when you're thinking about developing an e-commerce application, a communications application, your consumers and producers of data on that application are likely to be all over the place. 
So how do you architect your application such that it is giving the experience that is what you expect regardless of the location and there is no downtime and you get the zero latency future? So let's, let's go a little bit deeper onto microservices and cloud native. You know, what, what this graphic indicates is two, two, two visuals of some of the largest applications, right? Netflix and Amazon. And you can see there are hundreds of microservices that underpin an, an Amazon e-commerce environment or in Netflix uh, video delivery environment. These microservices are, are very loosely coupled. You know, they don't rely on each other. They don't necessarily uh, are dictated. So the, the, the reason microservices are in play is because it makes the management, the flexibility of upgrading, the ability to add new capabilities so much more flexible than, than you ever had. In the past, you would see software applications be updated every six months, maybe every 12 months, in some cases every two years. Because the reason was if you have an application with a million lines of code and that has to be updated, think about the regression and the QA cycle that has to happen, right? Now with microservices, the app is broken down where you can update subcomponents of the app. And you can see now, Amazon and Netflix, they update their apps every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. And it's not that they're updating everything, but they're peak picking up these microservices and doing. So these loosely coupled lab allow you to, to deliver the experience and to give you this better experience every single day, you, you're getting something new and something fresh. This is a, um, a simple representation. If you have an app that's supported by a number of microservices, each microservices it has an instance of a database that it talks to. And if you think about the example I gave earlier, where a microservice is a geospatial microservice, a second microservice is for your credit card information, a third microservice is for your profile information, and, and you can layer all of those. And each one has a specific need and requirement from a database, and it's possible that each microservice will use and apply a, a distinct database to achieve that objective. Now, Take an example of 100 microservices supporting an application, and if each one had a unique database instance, that could be a pretty complicated, it could be a nightmare to manage. And so the need for databases that have a multi-model approach becomes very important, so you don't have this variety of databases that you see at the bottom here. The next piece is multi-cloud and hybrid. I talked about it earlier. You know, when you develop the applications, you want to make sure they run on any infrastructure. You don't want to get locked in by AWS or GCP or Azure. You want to have the ability to run on any, and if possible, do it in a way that the workload can be shared across multiple clouds, the multi-cloud environment. Large enterprises that we sell to and we work with are all looking for a multi-cloud setting because they don't want to get locked into a single cloud. And second, very important piece is going back to the fact that the workloads will not shift to the cloud in its entirety, is you want a hybrid ability to serve cloud and an on-premises environment. And, and starting at the largest enterprises where this is a requirement, but I think as we go down over time, every company is going to want to have the flexibility. If they don't get the service or the pricing from AWS, you should be able to move to, to Azure or be able to work in New York they work on, on, on a AWS infrastructure. In Madrid, perhaps they work on a GCP infrastructure, right? And that flexibility is really important if you're thinking about building a global application. The next piece is availability everywhere, right? So geo-distributed, uh, multi-availability zones, and, uh, and just making sure that when you have this distributed environment, it is built in a way that it can resolve the conflict. If you have multiple sources which are writing to the, to the infrastructure, and certainly being read from different places, the chances of creating the conflicts are very high. And so you want the database technology, the network technology, and the entire services suite to be able to deal with that conflict resolution in a real-time basis. And, and foundational to all of the things we've talked about is data. You know, the world of applications almost flipped around. It used to be that you would build a large application, an ERP or MRP or you know, one of those applications, and then you would figure out what the source and the sync for the data was, and where you would store the data, what the retrieval pattern might look like, what the eviction policy might be, uh, what data is supposed to be hot, what data can be remain cold. You know, you would think about that after the app was developed. The world is really flipped, and the right way to do it is to think about what is the cadence of change of data, what's that velocity, 
What's the volume of data you expect today and five years from now for the app will continue to be used? And, and what's the kind of, you know, the presence of the data by geography, by time? There are many attributes that really are data-driven attributes that should then inform and drive your architecture for the application. You know, we, we talk about cloud-native data, and what does that mean? One is the data will be stored in multiple ways, so you want to support the data in a way that it's, it's schema-less and it can support the polyglot persistent, that you saw the variety of models that the data has to be stored in in the databases in this new microservice environment. You want to make sure it's a self-service architecture, so you can self-service and, and, and make changes over time. You want to make sure that, you know, it used to be where the changes were done so infrequently that the data processing had to be done at a much slower cadence. Today, you don't need to store every single piece of data. You might process the data and immediately evict the data because the processing done informed the analytics, transactions done, and you move on. You don't have to store everything. You have to decide what type of data you want to store, what type of data simply for processing to inform your immediate interaction, analytics, and so on, and then move on. And that eviction and, and ingest policies become very important. So all of these things need to have the flexibility and the ability to deal with a multi-cloud environment, a hybrid environment, and in an agile manner. So this takes us to the, the core of things where data resides, and that's databases. We all know, you know, data, database 1.0 was Oracle and, and MySQL and Postgres and, and all of that, and they continue to be the largest players. But those databases are not suitable for unstructured data. They're not suitable for, uh, for data that changes very often. And hence, about 10 years ago, NoSQL came into play. Companies like MongoDB, Redis Labs, and, and others came into play. And, and these databases allow you to deal with higher velocity, with all data types, and are, are more prevalent and ready for, for, for today's environment. And now as we move to the next level, can some of these databases evolve and morph to meeting the zero latency feature we talked about? Can they give you the response times that you need? Can they write and read at the, at the same instance? Can they deal in, in multiple use cases? Can they operate in the cloud? And can they operate on-premise? All of these things come into play as the desire to meet our consumer expectation of instant becomes real. So we have a vision that all data must be instantaneous. Doesn't matter where it's coming from, doesn't matter how frequently it's changing, doesn't matter who is producing it and how many people are consuming it. The data must be instantaneous to everybody. And so this is where, where Redis is. And, uh, and notice you know, about 20%, 25% of you have heard of Redis. So let me just share a little bit. Redis is an open source in-memory database. It's been a, around for about nine, nine ten years. Uh, this, in, in 2019, it's the 10th year anniversary. You know, one very simple measure in today's environment is the containerized world. So Docker is a standard for containers. And on Docker Hub, just about three weeks ago, Redis surpassed a billion launches. It is the most containerized database of, of any database in the world, a billion launches. That is a, a you know, there is no better data point to, to say how popular Redis is. In today's modern application architecture, the microservices architecture, containerized world, uh, Redis is, is number one. The second piece is the developer community absolutely loves it for its performance, for its simplicity, and for its extensibility. This survey that's run by Stack Overflow for the last two years has voted Redis by about 100,000 developers worldwide, voted Redis as the number one, the most loved database. Anybody wants to guess which database would be at the bottom, which is not here, um, the most hated database? I heard Oracle. So this is not meant to, if you work for Oracle, this is not meant to disparage you. Oracle is the number one in terms of the number of deployments. However, you know, the complexity of dealing with an, an, a legacy architecture, a traditional database, it, it's, it's very hard for the developers. Uh, the performance is not there, and the complexity is just is too much. So it's on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, DB Engines is a, is a site that tracks 340-some uh, databases around the world. And Redis is ranked number seven on DB Engines. And within the NoSQL category, it is ranked number two behind MongoDB. So just to give you some data points you know, on the viral interest and the love for Redis among the developer community. 
What we have done as Redis Labs is we are the company behind open source Redis. We invest quite a bit in, with the developer community. But to serve the enterprises, we have built on top of open source what we call Redis Enterprise. It is, it is a, a enterprise-grade solution that can be built and deployed at scale. It can be built and deployed in a highly geo-distributed environment. It can be delivered, it can deliver high availability with, with no data loss. It runs on all clouds. So we try to put in things that are very important for enterprises as they think about delivering this zero latency experience to the end users. And, and going back to the microservices world, you know, you think about if you had to deploy a graph database, a key value database, a document database, you know, and try to do for each microservice category you have, you would be saddled with a large amount of technology that you would need to have the competency in your companies to deal with. It becomes very complex to manage, becomes very difficult to train the people and to keep, keep that up. So what Redis and Redis Enterprise have done is, is offered a number of things that are inherently natively built into it. And we've done that in an elegant way using something called Redis modules. What you might hear about this multi-model approach by other databases, but they simply utilize an API to do calls with other functionality, and that's how they offer the multi-model capability. In that effort, they lose time, they lose performance, they do the translation, so there's inefficiency. What Redis and Redis Enterprise have done is, is these are all based on the Redis core. And these modules can work on the same data that resides in the database and pull in, depending on the use cases that is being utilized at that time, and can apply the services for graph, for key value, for document as, as, you, as you move forward. So it gives you the agility to bring in the, use, the capability you need for the use cases you're trying to serve, and gives you the ability to lever the same database without it becoming a highly complex environment to deal with. So it's sort of best of all words, flexibility without being saddled with the complexity that comes with other databases. Talked about availability on various clouds, so it can run in a multi-cloud environment on any single cloud, as well as on the right-hand side, you can download it as natively as a software and run it on any uh, bare metal that you want. You can run it in a, in a containerized environment if, if Kubernetes is your orchestration layer, which uh, it, li it most likely is. You can run natively on Kubernetes, or if you're running Pivotal infrastructure with PKS or Red Hat with OpenShift. So it gives you really the ultimate flexibility on deploying a, a Redis enterprise database, regardless of what your infrastructure looks like. And, and I wanted to share a little bit about, uh, about the scale and, and, and the performance. And what happens to most databases is you can have good performance when you've got a small scale. As you increase the scale, the performance degrades very, very quickly in most databases. What this chart is indicating is that regardless of the number, amount of workload or the ops per second, operations per second you're trying to get, you are not going to take a hit on the latency. So here it shows all the way up to 50 million operations per second continuing to be operating at sub-millisecond latency. And that's absolutely incredible. There is no other database that can do that. So if you're trying to do an e-commerce app or a communications app that's deployed in a global manner that's got this volume and an SLA of you know, running millions of operations per second, and you want to deliver the zero latency experience, Redis is, is the way to, to do it. The other thing on the horizontal axis you will notice is the number of nodes. So this is the infrastructure cost that's associated with your database. And because the database, if Redis is highly, highly efficient, very low footprint, you're able to get this level of performance with very small. So even at 50 million operations per second, which is very high end, you only need 26 EC2 instances on an, on an AWS infrastructure. What that translates into is a dramatically lower cost of operation when you're running Redis as opposed to other databases. And, and what we have done is, you know, talking about the multi-model environment, regardless of what you're running on Redis, whether it's you know, your standard NoSQL capability, you're running search, graph, streams, or serving machine learning algorithms uh, in conjunction with Spark uh, or, or some other uh, framework, you are able to get performance that several magnitudes higher than alternate options. All of it because the core model of Redis is the same, and these functionalities can layer in and leverage that performance that comes with Redis without having to sacrifice or do, or do API calls, which makes it slower and, and is resource intensive. 
The next piece is, comes into play when you've got active-active uh, environments that ensure that, you know, I talked about con uh, conflict-free free environment. If you've got a geo-distributed application you have deployed, your, your source and your sync might be very different. What, what's known in our terminology, master and a slave, might be very different. And they may change roles over time. How do you ensure that service is not disrupted? How do you ensure that you're getting local latency regardless of where the source of the data might be or the write is happening? How do you make sure that happens? We have something called active-active based on CRDTs that prevents from the data, from the, from, that takes care of the conflicts in the data and allows you to get local latency in a highly distributed environment. Next piece is consistency. So in the database world, this is, this is a big deal. So relational database like Oracle talk about strong consistency. No matter where you're writing and reading, you're always consistent data. When you move to a faster environment where the data is moving at a much faster clip, and you're trying to achieve the conflict-free resolution, and you're trying to do the multimodal aspect, it is incredibly hard to achieve strong consistency. In many use cases, it doesn't really matter. So what we have brought to the table is what we call tunable consistency. Ability to get strong eventual consistency, which means that you may not be immediately consistent, but over a period of time, you will be consistent as the data changes. And there's also an element of causal consistency, which means the consistency is informed of what happened prior to the, to the step you're, you might be in at the moment. And between those two capabilities, it gives plenty of flexibility for the app developer to achieve the consistency it needs in a geo-distributed environment, regardless of the scale and, and the volume of data we're talking about. The next piece is, uh, you know, I, I talked about one of the big paradigm shifts was persistent memory. Now, before that happens, what we have done over the last two, three years is Redis operates in RAM. That's its native state. However, there is a cost associated with RAM, more expensive than disk. So if you need the performance and you don't need all of the data to be in RAM, we allow, we have something called Redis on Flash, where you can put in hot values and keys in RAM and put the cold data on Flash. And, and you're able to get about 70% of the performance that you would when you put everything in RAM. And, and the cost saving is dramatic, right? And you don't have to go to a low performance environment like a hard disk. You can still back up stuff there and, and, and have replicas and so on, but, but for things that require the performance, you can balance your workload between RAM and the SSD. So that's the second step. And finally, as I said, we're working very closely with Intel and Samsung, so when they go, go live with the generally available persistent memory, Redis will operate on that as well. So it gives you tiering of memory at a, from an, an, in a very intelligent manner that doesn't degrade the performance, yet gives you the, perform, uh, the, the cost savings that, uh, that comes with some of these newer technologies. Now I want to shift gear a little bit to talk about what are people doing with, with Redis. And, and you, know, you might have heard, is it an, a database for transactions? Is it a database for analytics? And, and with Redis, being multi-model, being that it can be very, very high performance, it has the ability to operate in an analytics environment, it has the ability to run in a transaction environment, and certainly in an operations environment, as you can see from a large number of very simple use cases to very complex use cases. One of the things that's very unique with Redis that's at the bottom, it says translatical or HTAP. Those are terms from, from the analyst firms. But, but the, what, what that is is the same workload or the same data set can be applied and utilized for running your analytics algorithms. It can also be applied to executed transactions. But for the two things to be simultaneously done is where the complexity comes in, and most databases simply can't do it. So what we are able to do with Redis is you're able to inform the transaction based on real-time analytics. So what does that mean? That means that, let's say you've got X amount of data. You can go to the run queries on the data, do the analytics, and based on the results of the analytics, you can then inform whether the transaction should be executed or not. A very simple example might be a credit card transaction. Now, when you swipe your credit card, there is 10 to 11 steps that actually happen on a Visa, Amex, or MasterCard, or whatever you might be using. And, and those are trying to do a number of things at the same time. And you want that to be instantaneous, right? You don't have patience to wait there. So what Redis is able to do is look up all of your profile, your transaction history, your geo, where are you located, what was the last few transactions you did, your credit balance on the credit card, all of that, 
And if the answers are appropriate, then the transaction can be executed and Redis can help you run the session of the transaction as well. So trying to do that all in a, in a real time where you can get this zero latency experience is, as you can imagine, incredibly complicated. Redis is able to do that and, and, and you know, three of the top four credit card processes are our customers uh, doing exactly that. So that's an example of a, of a use case. And, and there are many, many more very large customers that, uh, uh, that utilize Redis in, in different industries. We have over 8,500 uh, customers with Redis Enterprise that have deployed this at large scale, serving tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases over a million transactions uh, or operations per second. Uh, we've got customers that are running several terabytes of data uh, running on Redis Enterprise as some examples. So instead of going through each one of them, I'm going to play for you a, a three-minute video. It'll give you a good sense of what some of, the, some of these big brands are doing with Redis. So hopefully you get a good sense of uh, the breadth of applications where Redis fits in and has been utilized by large enterprises. Um, we have a booth here if you have any other questions. Uh, you can experience Redis by going to this URL, redislabs.com, get started. Uh, there's a free service you can experience uh, you know, within a five minute, set up an instance of Redis and, and experience the performance and zero latency work that uh, Redis is able to do. I think we have uh, a few minutes for Q&A. Okay, maybe one or two questions. And on the theater, it fall asleep. Anybody awake? Well, feel free to stop by our booth. Uh, it's just around the corner. We have a whole team, technologists, uh, uh, folks that would love to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your time.